Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to live chat number 27, uh, Cube Editor's uh, chat series. Today we have a really, really special guest um, signing in all the way from Dhaka, Bangladesh. In the meantime, here is our book, which is the famous The New Silk Roads, The Present and the Future of the World by Peter Frankopan. Interesting book and going to be very relevant for today's conversation. Noor is here. I'm going to say hello and bring him on board. I hope this sign up happens smoothly. You can see us and hear us all loud and clear. Hi, Zulfi. Hello, Jean. Hi, Saira. Hamza, good to see you all. Familiar faces. Noor. Hi. Fantastic. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Assalamu Good to be Hi. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Nice to see you clear and hear you loud, loud and clear as well. Right. Good, good. Great. So we have a bunch of familiar faces, people who normally join us on these chats and who've been on this journey with me for the last 26. Today's chat number 27. Um, they're friends uh, and family of the Cube Editor who join us from all across the world, all the way from New York to um, Singapore and uh, Shanghai. Um, today, I'm going to introduce you quickly to say Noor Rahman Khan is an extremely accomplished architect, scholar, and educationist based out of Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. And as we've been developing the content for the Cube Editors, I thought it'd be great to now start bringing together a network of, uh, so to speak, architectural heritage and cultural design intelligentsia from the region and start bolstering up our work. So it goes just beyond me and the explorative journey I've been on for the last eight years. So Noor, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you've had a good day and I'm, I hope I'm not taking up too much of your time. But I not at all. I'm happy to be, be here. Um, really nice if you could do a little story journey with me. And what would you like to go on a little walk with me? Sure, let's do that. Let's do it. So it's the year 1220. And and not 2020. So I'm going to take you back to the year 1220. And we have met uh, right now at a caravan sarai in Kabul, or what is today's Kabul. It wasn't Kabul back then. And we're heading north. We're heading north to find the Silk Route. What do you think our conversation is going to be about? First of all, I think what it will be about uh, would be something much more interesting than what we are talking about right now. One of the reason being is that um, we'd be more connected. I hope so. Uh, when we talk to someone who's been yeah. on the Silk Route, it would be um, someone right. who's traveled all the way from uh, Afga Ka Kabul to China without worrying about visas and uh, you know, immigration yes. and, uh, you know, foreign policies of countries to whether to let you in or out. And, uh, and it would be a true understanding of, of a geographical identity of place. Right now, I mean, if we were to talk about, yes, I can talk to you about a little bit of Bangladesh. I probably would not be able to tell you what has happened anything in Pakistan over the last uh, 20 years, maybe. Uh, you'd probably not be able to see anything in Bangladesh because you'd have so much trouble coming here. And in yeah. between, uh, I mean, there is India, which uh, can't, you know, even actually organize a, a cricket fest with, with us three countries participating on their soil. So, you know, I mean, if you, <laughs> this uh, political boundaries that has come forth has, uh, taken away not yeah. only our freedom, but it has taken away our identity. I think that is the real loss. It has taken so much away from us that we forget that we were one country. 
and we we were this great subcontinent that people both on from both kabul side and from china side needed to interact with they needed to go through here they needed to be a part of this geographical location it was not something that they could bypass they needed the spice they needed to be here they needed to be a uh, you know to to be charmed by all the architecture and the culture that was happening over here and we were being enriched by all this too we were being aggressed even though we were agrarian society most places we were developing and then again we would sit around and we would talk about the good old days the good old days is uh, 2000 years ago you know or 3000 years ago when we had great cities cities that the china would talk about they would want to say oh have you been there and they would, and travelers would come to visit those places they would talk about the great universities that were in nalanda or they were uh, in uh, paharpur so uh, we would be talking about a past which we cannot even talk about now and i think we our 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 past has been hijacked from us i think that is the sad thing the thing is we have given in we have yes. given in to uh, uh we have become lazy to we have to admit this we do not want to really know a lot of the time we are being uh, handed narratives uh by uh, forgive me for saying this but uh, by western scholars who really have real no interaction with the, the totally totality of the subcontinent i mean even someone staying in the subcontinent would not have a total understanding of the totality of the subcontinent from one part to another and in that person and then we are reading narratives on uh, written by uh, people like this. the other danger the real danger is that we have people from from within ourselves who are writing narratives that would please them we are writing narratives that uh, that would satisfy western scholars and western canons and 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 help the or at actually you know take part in the uh, you know established pedagogy of teaching i mean who is this who are these scholars is is someone who's read 200 books a scholar or the person who knows how to make a brick dome a scholar so when when we when we uh, and 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 the thing is that all this is unwritten so when we look at the pedagogy of education and learning Uh, we are looking at a, a at a you know a set rule of as if these have to be referenced through article or through a book and all this the wealth of uh, of who we are, are, are has not been written maybe it was too much to write maybe it's because we did not invent the press like germany did and and, uh, and this is how the europe was able to take over the world or to you know have the great publishing houses of america and and to tell everyone that uh, they are the greatest country in the world i don't know where which way you can head with all that but definitely it will not be the way to find truth so when we were uh, meeting uh, at that caravan sarai we would have been dealing with truth we would have been dealing with real things we would have been dealing with things that we had have seen probably with our own eyes or we would have heard from people who would have seen with their own eyes not people who would have put it in a thesis or in an article and and we would have had probably the best kebabs <laughs> yes for sure and i wouldn't have been vegan in those days i'm sure so <laughs> <laughs> you would have had amazing food you can probably still have amazing food in kabul yes yes so yes um, so I, i i know I, i mean i'm not trying to be romantic over here actually i'm trying to be extremely uh, hard i'm trying to bring uh, you know really uh, talk about this whole a uh, position that we are in at this moment where all our education centers uh, depend on information that are narrate narratives that are uh, ill researched half truths and done with with very little effort these are narratives which have become rhetoric one book referring to another another book referring to another another book referring to another i mean how many of these writers have actually been on the ground 
I will show you something very interesting. A book that I was trying to, you know, in case you ask me a very difficult question, I picked up this book, Early India, which should be talking about early India means the whole subcontinent, not the India today. And and there is very little on on architecture of Pakistan or uh, East or Bangladesh for that matter. And and it's because the person probably ne- never made it to these two parts. So and and her uh, you know. Uh, source of information would have been somebody else's research or somebody else's writing or or somebody else's reference material. So this rhetoric is 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 um, is deafening. We've come to a point where this rhetoric is noise. It's just noise. It 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 doesn't say anything. It doesn't yes. imply anything. It is just a lot of noise. And we need to hear things, uh, maybe two lines, and those two lines will move you. And that is what we need to hear. I, and, and we need to feel something like that. We, we, we have to understand that, you know, the, even the Bengali that I speak some, has parts of it written in Taksida. So how can you say that you're uh, not a part of me? Uh, the food that goes into uh, my wedding is something that went through, came from Kabul, through Pakistan, through Northern India, into Dhaka. It was not something that we invented in this country. I mean, without a biryani, you cannot have a wedding. You can have a wedding even without a wife, actually. You can do it online. But without the biryani, your wedding is <laughs> nullified. So, <laughs> so, you know, so, so true. I mean, so true, you get it. So, so how can you take me out of the place? How can you take my language, my attires, my celebrations and say that and compartmentalize it with, with new, uh, new political boundaries and try to write uh, narr- narratives that is only convenient or easy to write? How can you define me with that? never so here's you know I agree with everything and some of it overlaps with the kind of discussions we've been having and the things I've been for the same history books that you're saying have taken uh, top pieces that are romantic to them and exotified it yeah have created this very biased tilted narrative sequence which has continued to distort itself because, like you said, one book is referring to the other. So like Chinese whispers, they've actually distorted that flimsy uh, narrative that was to begin with into something completely off. So I have two questions for you. You know, I think this is a time for people like you and me to to look at that narrative and find the holes in it, fill in the gaps, re-inject reclaim assuming that you and I are really the same because we share the same bioregion, the same foods, the water, the land. Mm -hmm. And if all of it is one big giant melange of culture, identity, food, fashion, music, that just shifts depending on where you're at, it's time to rewrite that narrative. Where would we begin? What do you think? Where would you and I, tomorrow I say, Let's meet in Kabul, fly across to Kabul. I'll meet you to, at Kabul. Let's sit down and start rewriting this narrative. Where would we begin? I think uh, the, um, in, 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 in terms of time, the way to begin would be actually, uh, we would have to take it uh, just before when uh, the connection started. I think we need to see uh, almost uh, over 2000 years back where, the, where before the time of real trade happened. And b- because at that point, we would find that uh, all these developments actually grew along uh, river lines. And that would give us a new map. That would give us a new understanding about development. Yes. And, and these never, without, because without that river, the internal trade that needed to happen would not happen. The internal, uh, you know, uh, the whole 
resources that a river provide would not have been available if, if we had not developed it. So it's in the in this valley civilization, the Ganges Valley civilization. It's all the valley civilization that you'd find from that time. So that would give us a clear understanding as yeah. to where our civilization first started. What's very interesting is the moment you say in this valley civilization, you've already said that there's a civilization there. And that is what's so beautiful in that term. You've already acknowledged that there's a civilization there. You're not saying that in this valley village or in this valley uh, hamlet or in this valley town, you're talking about something much bigger. Like when you say the Ganges Valley civilization, you're already talking about something much bigger. And when you've gone into that, I think you will find uh, a real starting, a point of, of, let's say, a purity, a point of where these were not yet totally connected but the starting of developments were happening within them to for these people to become powerful enough to draw attention. So I think that is would be an interesting point to start to uh, uh, just what was so great about these places that people from around the world heard of us and needed to come to us. So the Indus Valley civilization uh, ended up with Taxila and ended up with a Buddhist uh, facade. There's the pre-Harappan, which goes further back to uh, Harappa and to Mehergar, which is the oldest yes. 6,000 plus years. So what, what would we do? Would we dig up those books written by the archaeologists at that time, or we actually go to site and pick up our own information as a combination of archaeological uh, artifacts and some books. I mean, I have these three books on yeah. Mohenjo-daro behind me, which I absolutely adore. Um, and it's got excellent detail. Um, what would you suggest? Would we arrive at one of these sites and just for, I get a first-hand experience mm -hmm. that we feel about them and then get to the books or then get to the artifacts? What would be that process? Uh, I think what books would give you is information. But uh, 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 what you will feel or what you will understand intuitively is something that uh, books will never give you. I remember a very simple um, a journey that I did in uh, Ahmedabad. True. I went to see this step well, and, and it had very, very similarities with a mosque that I had seen in the decorations with a mosque I'd seen earlier. And then I was telling and, uh, the, uh, the person who had taken me that uh, most of these uh, people who worked here are probably uh, Muslims. And they said, no, 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 these were, it was built along the time of this Rani or that, uh, and it could not have been Muslims at that time. And then, I, but it bugged me. And then we went around the site. Something so powerful that it will, what can you do with information? Yourself to become a historian or archeologist. But how, how can you do something more with it? How do you, what do you do with this information? How do you take this information forward? Of, uh, you know, giving the uh, a nation back its history, or showing them a cultural history, or or to give, show a designer that what was uh, his old cities like. So, to do that, I think not. Uh, you know, a lot of information only becomes, again, it becomes a, a resource, but it does not really point somewhere all the time. The, you have to, uh, you know, walk that uh, walk. And I think intuition is very important. What happens when you particular when you go to a place? What do you actually feel? So that is also very, very important. The other thing is uh, we have to change the way that we teach in universities. We have to, we have to kind of, in a way, with no disrespect to historians, uh, we, have to, uh, yes. we, have to, uh, we have to tell them that True. to teach history in a way where history is, it cannot, no longer can just be a narr narrative as to what king made what. Uh, it should be about why it was made. 
what did it do what was the importance what is the significance of that building we have we still have policies in our country like a building will be preserved it's 200 years old it could be a piece of 200 year old shit and why should we preserve it whereas there could be something else which is not so old but is extremely significant and we need to preserve that one this archaeological all these uh, you know policies that we have sometimes are not always the right policies that we need to understand to teach history and archaeology where the significance of the works need to be brought forward by those who are teaching the schools have to uh, uh, you know alongside with of course teaching whatever they are they need to uh, uh, you know uh, bring in the whole idea that there is something there that is valuable to me that feel of value of something has to come and it it comes through if 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 the right teachers the right writers the writing right teachers are teaching and and to tell that uh, a person across the table is that this is the why you should know not just because it is old or it's a history book or we should finish this course and and this and what better way to do that than to be on site on site there is no course there is no bell there is no break there is no oh uh, you know there now i have the next class after this yeah. you know it is the site which will move my, my student in a way better or more than it it had moved me i have to open that window to them i have to let have the let them give that experience i have to make them better than me and the only way to do them is to power the intuition and that can never be uh, uh, done without Uh, in in a powerpoint in a studio and that's that's um that's really how i started all of this which you already know now that uh, the classroom wasn't yeah. inspiring the students it wasn't generating any curiosity it wasn't yeah. creating any kind of trigger in their imagination for them to um even feel a spark of desire access right. that value till we started going and touching the buildings until we didn't start touching them yeah. that we didn't drop and i think you've hit it right first hand experience is there's no there's no substitute for that um but what it what it does it's interesting you should mention policy so i looked at um an accreditation document for some of our universities here several years ago it was just sent to me to say you know you're always complaining about what they're teaching in schools and what is the curriculum and there's not enough this is what we used to do accreditation for uh it was first of all very thin so it had no it had no substance was has created mostly by and for bureaucrats and and the way we create scholars is a paradigm that needs to be redefined what is a scholar in your mind yeah um what does it mean to be scholarly uh or to uh, uh do you really become scholarly with a lot of second hand knowledge or or if or are you scholarly because you have a a, a knowledge that you are able to define on your own so what is the meaning of being scholarly is, is important to understand and and yes you can know a lot but um, a, a scholar uh, then then you are taking away the thinker of a scholar away you are trying to uh, straight jacket the scholar in someone as someone who's done uh, research and who's done who has access to a lot of references and who has read a lot but uh, is do we if we take away the thinker from the scholar then we are uh, 
having a scholar that only is good to himself really it is the thinker that will really charm and i think that is very important it is the thinker that can uh, inspire someone else to think and uh, a, a scholar all, on a lot of times is sometimes intimidating because the scholar is always already so heavy that uh, for a lot of minds a scholar is sometimes intimidating in the sense is that oh, this this is too hard for me but a thinker comes from a position and a scholar can also be a great thinker i'm not saying it cannot be the same person what i'm trying to say it is the thinker in a person which can uh, tell us something in such a way that will start to make us think too because a real thinker is able to transfer that uh, enthusiasm and that energy across i think that is very very important it is um uh, and then again from you know if we look at another uh, aspect of it like i was saying i mean somebody uh, a workman who knows how to make a flat brick ceiling or how to make a brick dome is he not a scholar of his own trade if he is not a scholar in his own way or if you go to a distant part and somebody is able to explain to me uh the uh, development of five havelis or 10 mosques or a bridge or uh, is that not person not scholarly is that does not that thing that i am i do not know does that person not have knowledge of something that is not printed somewhere that i can learn from so you know i mean there are uh, a couple of ways that we should be looking at who is a scholar and what is scholarly and uh, is with uh, you know uh, many pedagogy of uh, of teaching now i think that is the real problem we we need to identify everything as as part of a uh, a uh, uh, course this course systems then everything or we are all talking about international standard I, i mean what i wonder what what this international standard really is and and then you know and all when we are trying keep on modifying our education system so as to lead on to be further taught by the west are we learning more of our so you know that our our education system has not really um uh, got space in it for uh, uh, critical thinking and to generate thinkers uh, uh, at all it's a clerics i mean uh, i just to so just to sorry clerics i know just to sorry to butt in uh, but you know i mean uh, critical thinking is is something which is not really a part of the subcontinent i mean uh, we we've been taught to not to argue with our parents or our super you know elders you try going and having a critical discussion with your mom i'd like you to try to see to do that you do that you know what i mean so the thing is you see this is something that which is not really within us but uh, so even uh, when we say critical thinking uh, even i think that needs to be uh, reshaped it has to be shaped in a particular way with, where it is not the a um, standard way of what is understood to be critical thinking because even this concept of critical thinking is a, a western dogma it is not critical thinking is not a western dogma i mean is a is a sufi considered a critical thinker but isn't he not a critical thinker he is he is <laughs> he is a critical thinker and that's why he's marginalized because they don't really yeah. want to accept that and i think that you yeah. again hit a fantastic point because it might be time to also reconfigure this idea of an international standard because it's always been a whitewashed international standard and i do mm-hmm. mean that literally that um, it's been a western centric international standard that suits their needs and as we see the systems collapse today 
it might be a fantastic opportunity to actually reframe that international standard. Like, what does that really mean? And what is it? What is it missing? And what yeah. can we add to it from, from uh, taken out of it over the last thousand years? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one very simple thing to look at. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, it was not, it was only recently that we've stopped hearing the word Western civilization. The whole idea was as if civilization, civilization belonged to the West. Yeah, it was only after some writers who've written enough to tell them that, uh, hey, I mean, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, are, you, uh, are we not civilized when we made universities 1400 years ago, or was that an act of barbarism? Or uh, when we actually made cities and ports and we had granaries and treasuries, are, were we just doing this out of whim or were we not organized enough to uh, make those things? So <laughs> you see, uh, uh, it, it's all these is that the whole idea of uh, this Western civilization and Eastern civilization has somehow broken down now, which is at least we've made one, you know, that, that part has stopped in the world at least. Nobody has got that city to harp on the whole concept of Western civilization anymore. Civilization is civilization, and you have to draw up certain ideas of what you consider to be civilized. And according to that, you have to judge civilization. So, um, and I think people have to understand that industrialization is not civilization. And civilization is, is something else. So, uh, again, so... Uh, uh, and, and, and within civilization, within, I mean, when, when you, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I might, might be overdoing a bit over here. Uh, uh, we, can you remind me when we had WCs in this part of the world? And, uh, <laughs> and when a lot of the world did so not. So we have WCs <laughs> in Harappa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so exactly yeah. my we point. We WCs so in the, the thing is that, civilization, so... Yes. Yeah. So my point exactly, what do you, how do you want to define what is being civilized? You know, so the whole thing is, this is the first thing is about this uh, concept of uh, what is civilized. The other concept that needs to be broken down is the concept of exotic. This is something not only the West do to us, it is we do this to ourselves. Yeah. We will go to a historic site and look at it, how pretty it is. Yeah. I mean, it is not about being pretty. It is not about being exotic. I mean, uh, I mean, and, and sometimes we even take a tourist book written and see. The whole idea is that, um, I mean, uh, from New York wants to come to Bangladesh to see, uh, you know, people in the rice fields and he finds it exotic. Somebody from like me going to New York and finding the Brooklyn Bridge exotic is the same thing. I mean, exotic is just something which is different or something that I have not seen. Concept or the idea of exotic has been, you know, hijacked by uh, the West. And they, they say it, they, as if it, it belongs to them, the term, everything else that is different from them is exotic and everything which is to them is um, you know, normal. I mean, uh, and then, uh, you know, for that matter, uh, you know, for us, uh, like I said, Brooklyn Bridge would be exotic. The, the, the Golden Gate Bridge would be exotic. The Miami Beach would be exotic. I mean, we'd have our own a whole set of exoticness <laughs> that we would find, you know. So the whole thing is, uh, these we have to kind of break down these, um, uh, I would say, uh, the certain vocabulary needs to change within us. This is very important. We need to keep on not using certain things which, which are uh, used in a particular way uh, and, and actually has been monopolized by certain uh, groups. And we need to not use those vocabularies as much. I mean, and then, then only then we can bring, uh, start writing our own narrative and, and, and to define what is uh, modernization, what is civilization, what is exotic, or, or even leave out the whole term exoticness altogether. I mean, uh, it's, it's a way for us to uh, want 
to do this i think that is the most important is that how much do we really want to uh, you know uh, uh, grow this self respect of ours how much do we believe that that if from that launching pad we will go further than where we are today if we think that we need uh, uh the western narrative for us to become modern or to be advanced then uh, have we forgotten who came up with the uh, zero have we forgotten who dis- uh, who developed algebra or who, de- who de- devised uh, ayurveda or who, or who came sorry who came up with ayurveda and who came up with uh you know other uh, you know what do you call uh, mathematical calculations cosmic calculations i mean uh, i i am pretty much sure it did not really come from the, the other side of the uh, olymp you know atlantic uh, i mean that matter maybe south america had its own uh calculations i'm sure but again that they have been uh you know totally disregarded the same way other civilizations have been disregarded so the and 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 then the packaging of saying that that's inca civilization or this is indus valley civilization or this is these packagings are extremely dangerous this packaging tar- turn us into tourist sites yeah this packaging turn us into uh, yes. you know documentaries they don't they, they they don't make it real anymore they do not they they do not make it tangible they are no they no they make it, they don't bring meaning to us they don't make make them alive to us so i think this we have to be careful about uh, that uh, we have to realize that how these things are packaged and who it they are being packaged by and we need to i would say not repackage them but i would say we must start engaging with them other than that what is within the package which is uh, uh, you know and we don't know how it has been packaged so the whole thing is and for whose agenda for who, who, who i mean who's re, who's benefiting from this uh, uh, you know uh, construct we have to understand i mean whether uh, and whose agenda are we serving we have to understand so uh, this is where scholarly studies are uh, and they i would say there uh, there are dangerous paths is that sometimes we, we without our own realization we will be uh, swayed by somebody else's motives and and then that is where being on site getting there makes you have your own motive make your own agenda your own feel and it's not like you have to go and see every site it's a, it is i think to anyone who really wants to have a connection with their own culture their self their own belonging and to feel who they are uh, you can just go connect with them i will just uh, you know i mean and this whole conception of uh, you know a culture is something very important to understand why we need our past to understand who we are is so important is because i'll explain i was on this seminar on the 50 years of corbusier in chandigarh and then a renowned writer charles jenks was there and he came up and he was talking about the corbusier and buildings anyway and he said the spaces are too big and i kind of got a little furious about that so i stood up and i needed to you know answer to that so i went and said that Uh, i'm going to forgive mr charles jenks uh, of his ignorance about the subcontinent because he has never been here before but i can tell you this much it is not too big he has no idea of celebrative space in this part of the world and i'll give you one comparison which i was telling him at that time is that uh, the official guests on the sit down dinner to uh, prince uh, you know diana's wedding at that time charles uh, you know was under 1000 and in my wedding there was 1200 people and i'm no royalty so the thing is the scale and culture of people in this part of the world is different and we know it we feel it but can can we try to put a little more effort in understanding it i think that is what is important i think that is what you are trying to do for to provide people with a better understanding of uh who we are as people as place and culture and our past (laughs) 
No, actually, um, yes, I am ownership. Not only should it, but take. culture and the scale of culture, the depth of it, the history amongst the between the rivers and the lands and the mountains, we all need to take big push underneath everything else. Is can you not be ashamed of it? Mm. Can you not feel like it's something that's been uh, like you said exotified and left on the side and stop mm. looking at yourselves from a Western lens? Take that lens off, look at yourself yes. and what you have and accept it for what it is and own it. Own it. My big thing is ownership that, you know, take your shoes off, okay. stand on yeah. the earth, feel yeah. that earth. You know that that history is yours. Just because somebody else wrote about it doesn't mean it belongs to them. It belongs right. to you. And you are welcome to question it and welcome to rewrite it. it, does, it it's your spirit. It's your alignment. Right. It's your connection to the cosmos, it's yours. Right. And however that history yeah. may be, colonial, yeah. pre-colonial, Mughal, tribal, whatever, it's you you can discuss it and debate it and critique it, but learn from it. At the end of the day, right. you still have to own it. There's no point in being ashamed of it or disowning it and saying, Oh, that was not that's not really a part of my history that I want to right. be, be a part of. But why? I mean, our, sphere, our shared histories from Kabul to the uh, swamps of Bangladesh, it's, it's an incredible history across and down, all the way down to Kerala. So, you know, the, uh, the elephants that are suffering in Kerala recently, they, I feel like they, they belong to me as well. There, there's no reason, to forget it, it doesn't matter. The elephant has died in Kerala, but why is that any different to my elephant suffering in Karachi or in Islamabad? You know, so it, it's this whole bio region. And for me, the big thing, at least in Pakistan, no, is to get people to accept their land and own its history. You know, that's really my big thing saying, wear it. I have such a fascinating conversations with people to get them to wear kurta salwars on site, to get them out of their jeans and sweatpants and t-shirts and say, there's people who've lived here for millennia who wear these clothes. You want to go on a trip. It's a, it's a local fabric, it's the silhouette, it's comfortable, it's cool, it's easy to maintain, easy to wash, uh, so to speak, a climate change, a climate, also a cultural climate. It's not just the air and the earth and the water. There's this cultural imperialism, this cultural demolition, that imposition of things that are all self-centric. Take the environment into account and the environment is also human heritage. It's also cultural heritage and tradition. Ownership for me, something that is very, very important to accept it, to own it. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it has to start off with ownership, of course. You, you, if you do not believe in owning uh, your past uh, and who you are, then, then no matter what kind of curriculum change we do or what kind of policies we make or what kind of books we write, it's not going to have uh, uh, any deep cut. The main thing is um, uh, it is important to have this ownership. What is important also to understand is that uh, what has gotten in the way of ownership? I think we have to look into that first. One, a couple of things have gotten into the way of ownership because our The, it's the total subcontinent that is our real ownership, and and with all the you know, all the political events and all the political boundaries over time, that it is very hard for for many minds to actually reach beyond those political boundaries and claim ownership, and that is uh, uh, something that we needs to be redefined 
uh, while when we are trying to explain uh, cultural history uh, or uh, our archaeological history or, or architectural history or whatever, uh, social history for that matter also. So now uh, this is something, I think this is something which has truly really affected us. The other thing that has affected us in terms of ownership is that uh, we are overcrowded with uh, junk. Uh, you know, there was a fantastic book that day I was reading. It was called Junk Space. It's about within architecture where we're making a lot of unnecessary space. which is like junk food, which is junk space. We just imported it and we're putting it in because it's uh, it's something which is out there, everyone has it, so let's have one of those. So the thing is, the whole concept is that, what, what I'm trying to say is that we have so much, so much junk that we have to own right now. We, we have to, in terms of, inform, we have to own Netflix, we have to own Spotify, we have to own uh, vacations to exotic places. We have to own, there are so many other things that we have to own so much junk that we are being bombarded with that is crowding our time, that to find time within ourselves to own something which is ours is becoming difficult. And, and also information. You see, when you are talking about the dress and the place and building material and all that, you have to realize, let's look at a time when there was no import. There was no ways to fly things from around the world. Right now I can get a uh, sofa from Italy. I can get a chandelier from Amsterdam. Let's talk about time when you did when you couldn't do that. So and then you could not get your uh, you know uh, 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 a synthetic uh, material shirt from Japan or something like that. So uh, you would be bound to what was only around you, and you'd concentrate to what was only around you because you'd look at other things. You'd look at uh, comfort in according to your climate. You'd look at availability and technology within your climate. You'd look at a uh, craft within your climate and you'd work around those. And uh, from those, you'd be able to create, uh, create many things, you know? I mean, that day I remember I, I, um, I, I was in India and I literally, uh, you know, uh, made an agenda of buying a Kashmiri shawl because with the state that is in Kashmir, I mean, all the uh, dear ladies, the elderly ladies who are, you know, sewing these beautiful shawls will no longer be doing it. They're troubled, they're disturbed, they're dislocated. And you see, though the love and affection in which those elderly uh, have been doing this craft is not going to be the same when it comes down into newer hands. It will not be anything like it when it will be transformed into a machine. So you see, uh, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes things were so uh, to the place, of the place, that it, it becomes something just from there. And when you are in a world where it is open to import, export, information, and, and, and so-called tra technology transfer and this and that, you are crowded with, with so much uh, other stuff that it, it is hard for people to actually center themselves or focus themselves to orient themselves in a particular manner. And this is, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think a problem. It, it is a problem worldwide. It is not just us. It is a problem happening anywhere. I'm sure Japan is going through the same problem. I think we're going through the same problem is that this over internationalization and globalization of things has taken a toll on us. Uh, there is only so many hours in a day. There is only so many years in our life. There is only so much that we can interact with. And when it becomes crowded or when we are in a way it has been crowded again, because it serves somebody else's agenda. Why are we buying uh, a brand name t-shirt? Because somebody else makes money out of it. And we, and it is branded in a particular way that you are not, uh, you have not reached a particular class if you do not wear that thing of that particular brand. So that, the, the, there, is a, uh, there is a huge uh, capitalist agenda. There is, I wouldn't say capitalist agenda, there is money 
behind all that i mean i sometimes tell you know when people watch all these star you know dramas i keep telling people they're funded by all the jewelry makers and the sari makers the uh, sari shops and say why you want to know look at this person she's dying and she's wearing a diamond necklace and, uh, you know so the whole thing is that it's because it is it, it, there are people who are throwing images at you and this image after image crowds your mind it takes you away from the way that you should be thinking yeah. can we restore that with other images i think that is what you are trying to do also you're trying to restore that um, uh, uh, the, this bombardment of this image that are serving others and we are not even understanding how we are serving others and we can replace those images with something else one thing is that i mean for for example uh this this particular talk that we are having um miles away i mean we, without have the hassle of a visa or airline ticket and even in the middle of all this covid even without face masks you know so it's it, and we have to find a new way to get the images out there to get the uh, in, uh, you know the um uh uh you know the way that we want to say in the new world has to be new and this is why i think i mean when you picked up uh, something as hip as insta to do this i think that is the way i mean if you want to uh, you know uh, go to the crowd you have to speak their lingo so it is important that way i mean it's it, yes. be it insta be it youtube i don't I don't care how it gets to them but we if we keep on saying that no we you guys have to come to this particular seminar that is going to happen in lahore or karachi on this date we have to go beyond all this realistic also we have to find out that uh, uh the information has to be dissipated it has to go it has to reach people and we have to find ways and technologies in which it will be acceptable to a new generation i think you know uh i i always have uh, faith in the youth i have faith the youth uh, ha- have if directed can be of use the the youth has a way of finding all the uh, anxieties that you and i are sharing today and 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 i think that is important how that our patients our you now would be uh, you know interested and charmed to discover themselves and and to you know find themselves in in a new way i mean uh, uh you know uh, whether uh, they uh, wear their uh, wear uh, Uh, armani long jacket with their kurta it is their decision they will uh, you know define themselves but the whole thing is that at least uh, uh, you know exposing to them to their own identity is 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 uh, the responsibility of our generation yes i mean you're talking about choices i feel like um the history that we've been taught has taken away choices of certain thoughts yes. from us and if we can it's such a wonderful word you've used i have a word restore that if we can restore a new vocabulary not say take away the old let them have access to all of that but give them another layer and say here are your choices you can pick one or the other or you can create a hybrid and you can do a mixture of the two so that you can define your own identity and define your own future but at least i think like you said we have a social responsibility to give them that restoration and say here is another alternative yeah. here is a, here's another history here's another narrative here's another way of looking at the same situation and get that debate that discourse going so that like you said a new vocabulary develops from it a new set of definitions of everything we've accepted and many things we've accepted like foie gras they've just been shoved down our throats and we've been turned into these fat useless creatures to be consumed by the capitalist market 
and we've allowed it to happen. You know, yeah. there's also that element that we've been for so many years we've been made to believe that this is the only right. We've actually absorbed it yeah. and internalized it almost genetically. So if you tell somebody, can you please think about this and can you please question it? They're like, but why? We this is what we've known for four hundred years. So it's yeah. it's astounding. Um, the kind of discussions you and I are having, and this has been such a pleasure. When I have similar conversations with, in within my own vocabulary, I see people's sort of brains opening up and thinking, "Wow, that's true. We could be thinking about this." And then the penny slowly drops. And I think that you know, as we go through this breadcrumb trail back in time. If I say the same thing that you say, and then somebody from India says the same thing, somebody from Myanmar says the same thing, somebody from Afghanistan and Iran and Turkey, and all of us in this region start saying the same things, then that movement of repetition, like a chant, of the same, we need yeah. an alternative narrative. Here is our alternative history. Things have been taken away. We yeah. need to all reclaim and exactly. restore our. Um, ownership of our land and our identity then it would be so incredible to then create a new pedagogical yes. framework and new set of curriculum and a new international standard that actually is inclusive of what we think the international standard that we know that we've been taught by doesn't actually include my opinion or yours i think it'd be quite nice yeah. if our opinions were included <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know yes um, yes i think so but uh actually uh, uh in in order to uh, have like you said uh, the first thing is uh, in order to have opinion <clears throat> one must have ownership and otherwise uh, your op even your opinion is also not your own in order to uh, build your own opinion to have ownership of uh, your own self is is so important and it is from the realization that i need yes. to have ownership of my collective self and my collective self is the total subcontinent and the total subcontinent is my collective yes. self and 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 it is from this collective <clears throat> self of uh, the subcontinent is where i can see the breadth and depth of who i am and it is from there where i will see uh, a greatness uh of um uh, uh of uh, of my opinion being uh, formed i will form my opinion from this notion of my uh, realization of self and that opinion will be then powerful so it is it, it and it is so important to formulate a, a opinion which which i i can believe that it is actually me thinking it is actually mine i or otherwise what happens is that uh, so so much of me uh, could be uh, could be um, constructed that my, in my opinion can yeah. uh, could also be constructed without even my uh, total uh, without my total control over it and i think uh, you know anyway this would be this was uh, really exciting uh where i think coming up to our uh, one hour uh mark uh, yes. so i i hope i've been useful to you the only thing you know i mean um, i envy you in the sense is that you're sitting in place of great kebabs and then i can't get out here because it's really uh, the situation is quite bad over here but you owe me uh, you owe me a dinner sometime <laughs> for sure no i owe you a dinner but and i'm hoping that this conversation will not end here it's been fantastic you've said so many things that i hadn't thought about you rephrased and reframed so many things in a beautiful well articulated elegant manner so i can't thank you enough for your time i owe you a lot more but i think that owe you dinner will only happen when you agree to redo the curriculum for the region with me and come on board and find yeah. a way of reconstructing this digital system yeah. to connect yeah. um our future's youth to the experiences of their heritage to help me build and restore their sense of ownership.